water you turned into wine You open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you There's none like you oh. And into the darkness you shine and out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you yeah. There's none like you And our God is greater And our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other And our God is No one like you, yeah. There's none like you. Oh. And into the darkness you shine, yeah. And out of the ashes we rise. There's no My name's Liz Featherstone. I'm part of the leadership team here at Book and Baptist. A uh, very warm welcome to you, whether you are here for the first time or whether you're a regular. This service is going to last about an hour. So we've got Luke Hamlin, who's going to be leading us through some worship. And then Steve's going to be preaching later, taking us on the next stage of the Exodus journey. Let's pray as we come to the start of this service. Father God, we thank you that you are with us. We thank you that wherever we are, your spirit is present. And Father, whether we come with hearts bursting full of joy or come from a place of sadness, I thank you that your promise is true, that when we draw near to you, that you draw near to us. And we thank you, Jesus, again, that you are here, that you've made it possible for us to meet with the Father. We thank you. 
And as we bring our worship to you, would it be honouring and would you also, would you transform us more and more into your likeness as we spend time together in your presence. Amen. Got a big stick here. It's not quite a staff, but it will do. Moses had a pretty awesome time with his staff. Not only did it turn into a snake when he threw it in front of Pharaoh, but it was what God used to part the Red Sea. And as we learned last week, it was used to hit against a rock and out gushed water. So our story today features Moses' staff again. So, Israelites are camped out. The Amalek people arrive and they start battling. And Moses goes up the hill, has his staff in his hand, And when he's holding his stick above his head, his army are winning. When his arms drop, the enemy is winning. Go on, have a try. Hold your arms out. It's pretty tough. I think Moses was having a bit of a difficult time with this. And while we're holding our arms out, we're going to play a quick game. So I'm going to say a word, and you are going to give the pair that goes with the word. So, for example, I might say left you say right, okay? I say on, you say off. And don't forget, keep your arms up. So, bat and, snakes and, day and, sausage and, okay, are you chips or are you mashed potatoes? I could go either way. Okay, hot chocolate and marshmallows would be my choice. Salt and gin and Chloe threw that one in. Um, Bread and how many of you said wine? That was James's go. (laughs) Romeo and cat and Mary and, okay, are your arms still up? Really tough, hey? Do you know what? God had a plan for Moses. He sent him up the hill, but he was with Aaron and her. And when his arms were getting tired, his friends noticed, sat him on a rock, and each of them held a hand up for him. So maybe if you've got somebody in the room with you, they could help. Hold your arms up. Makes a difference, doesn't it? Isn't that incredible as well? That God planned for us to be together. To be community, to be church. To know what it is to help each other and to be helped. Just like all those things in the game, they're fine on their own. Give them a pair so much better. And it's really tough. It's really tough being away from people, isn't it? I know Jonah and Chloe are are really finding it hard not seeing their friends, not being at laser lights and power pack, not playing their sport, not being at school. We're finding creative ways of being with people, aren't we? And there's so much that we've been taking for granted that we're learning to be thankful for again. And the love and support I've had from my friends has been incredible. But more than that, God needed his people to know, didn't he, that he could be trusted, that he is the God above all things, the almighty God. And he was saying, I've got this. Be still and know that I am God. Speak to me and know that I am for you. Now, we're going to be praying together a little bit later in the service. And hopefully um, the kids out there, you've received your kids at home. And um, if you haven't seen the email yet, then I would just encourage you to get yourself a piece of paper and a pen and just draw or write about the people that you want to see God blessing, that you wanting to see um, Jesus meeting with and, and supporting them at this time. And we're going to be using that a little bit later in the service. We're now going to hear from Luke Hamlin and his family, and then he's going to lead us into a later time of worship. Hello. Hi. Hello to all our friends in Bookham. Greetings from the Hamlins. Uh, we hope you're doing okay. We've missed seeing you over the last few weeks, but excited that we can be part of your online service today. How's everyone doing, Eleanor? Um, I'm doing schoolwork 
I'm enjoying being in the garden. Brilliant. Ethan? Bored. Bored. <laughs> Sarah? <laughs> really busy, working lots, doing some extra days um, and enjoying some time at home. Much of my time has been spent with these two, uh, doing some schooling and uh, some creative stuff and then working when I can around that. Um, Sarah's obviously been very busy in her NHS role, um, but we're doing okay and we are hopeful and joyful and excited about what God is doing and saying at the moment. Um, so look forward to seeing you again when we can and until then, goodbye from the Hamlins. Bye! Bye. Bye. Bye.
Well, good morning, everybody. Um, we um, 
taken this chance to um, uh, do a frontline interview. And the, these are interviews with people from Book and Baptist um, talking about their day-to-day -day life and how faith really relates to that. Um, and this morning, I'm interviewing my wife, um, Juliet Lambert. So, Jules, why don't you tell um, people a little bit about us, our family, uh, and our children? Sure. So, good morning, everyone. Um, yep, so I'm married to you, aren't I? <laughs> and between us, we have two daughters, um, Hannah, who is 14, and Jenny, who's about to be 13. Um, and tell us a little bit um, about how you came to faith um, your, and your journey to faith? So I grew up in a Catholic family um, and we went to church every week um, but if I'm honest um, I wasn't interested at all as a child or as a young mm. person and um, particularly as a teenager and in my 20s I lived very far from God. I lived a very hedonistic um, lifestyle um, but when I got to about 30 I had a sort of I guess you'd call it a personal crisis. And mm -hmm. I just thought there must be more to life than this. Um, so I kind of went on a search really. And I did a yoga course, <laughs> a meditation course. Um, and then my flatmate at the time, who is still one of my best friends, um, said she wasn't a Christian, but she said her parents had been badgering her to do an alpha course. So she mentioned this, I didn't know anything about it. But I looked into it and thought, okay, I can do this. So I did an alpha course at Holy Trinity Brompton in London, and yeah, it really changed the course of my life. Wow. Yeah, I believe Nicky Gumbel yeah. actually led that course um, with a big group there. And then, you know, what, how did that then lead into, having come to faith, how did that lead into the work that you chose, and, and what did you really feel, if you like, called to or kind of connected to as a result? I guess sort of the word family really sums it up, um, you know, so sort of initially our family, um, you know, I yes. met Paul, you know, shortly after doing the Alpha course and um, we got married and we had children quite quickly. So I felt God really say to me during that season, he wanted me at home full time and we were very fortunate to be able to do that. So I was at home for the children's um, early years. Um, and then I began to help other families. I worked um, at the Book and Baptist um, Children's Centre, Wellspring as it was helping mums and babies. Um, I worked with Moira and I also um, helped parents who were struggling at Eastwick and more recently I've gone on to do parenting courses um, for younger children and now um, for the parents of teenagers. So quite a variety of things all connected into this whole kind of family mm -hmm. parenting mm -hmm. um, and yeah some interesting jobs you know sometimes here in the church and sometimes uh, at yeah. the school. Yeah. Um, um, so things have changed a bit, haven't they? We're in a very kind of different season mm. with everybody coping with COVID mm. and Corona. You know, so how, has, you know, how have you transitioned into this season and what have you felt um, is important now? What are you up to? Well, I guess um, most recently I've been um, one of the welcome administrators here at Book and Baptist Church, um, where I've welcomed families and sort of done a lot of admin, help plan events and do the ordering and things like that. But um, obviously, as the sort of lockdown started to happen, um, I wasn't able to do that role anymore because there was no one to welcome, sadly. Um, and I felt God really prompt me and say that He really wanted me to use my practical skills during this time. So I sort of prayed into it and I thought it was difficult to know what to do because our children, you know, um, were at home. So I couldn't sort of go out all day, but neither did I need to sit right next to them um, and help them with their mm. learning because they're old enough to be independent in that respect. Um, so I responded to a an appeal for people to handle calls for a new helpline, um, which is called the Community Coronavirus Care Helpline. Um, so um, I'm one of 30 people um, who are taking calls um, from the vulnerable and the self-isolating. Um, it was set up by a, um, a local group of people who wanted to support um, those people during this crisis. Yeah, and um, you've dealt with a lot of calls, I know, and um, you've got a lot of helpers. So just... Yeah, give us a bit of a flavour because, um, yeah, you've had some interesting um, calls to deal with and mm. some some great experiences, actually, some really helpful experience for people. Yeah, so there's been about about 3,000 calls now um, wow. from people locally. So when I say locally, it's not just Bookham and Fetchum and Effingham, yeah. it's Epsom, Cobham, Leatherhead as well. Um, yeah, and there's been um, about 2,000 
sort of tasks undertaken by 200 volunteers who, who are on the ground doing these, um, these jobs that result from the phone calls. Um, so mainly, the, so the people phoning are the elderly, anyone who has a health condition who can't go out, um, parents of children who um, might have underlying health conditions who can't go out. Um, and so some of those calls are straightforward. They, mm. they want um, food shopping and they want prescriptions collected. Um, so that's, I would say, the majority of the calls. Um, but we do have others too. Um, I took a call recently from a gentleman who was um, an elderly guy who was sobbing with loneliness. He just said, you are the only person that I've spoken to for two weeks. And it was, it was desperate. Wow. Um, and I, I take calls from people who literally say they have nothing, they have no food in the fridge, and they have no money. So it's amazing to be able to put them in touch with the food bank and the community fridge. Um, lots of anxious people are phoning up. Um, I had a lady last week who's going through chemo, um, desperately worried she might get sick, um, and and also people who are just generally anxious for not only health reasons, but financial worries as well. So this, this whole started with, um, you know, your own faith journey and, and reaching out. So how is this connecting with your faith now? And how do you feel uh, about what you're doing and what God's saying to you in the midst of it, really? Yeah, I think, I think God's really saying to me that, you know, sort of working for this helpline, it's meeting a practical need, but also helping people to connect with somebody. And that's really, really important. Yeah. And I feel... Um, you know, God's really saying that he would love this initiative to carry on when the season is over mm. in some form. Um, I feel God's really saying that there's going to be a big need in our mm. community going forward. And um, as a church, we can respond to that, you know, with CAP, the Children's Centre, the Meeting Place, the Community Fridge. But I also feel God's really saying that we need to adapt and respond in new ways as well to help the community going forward. Um, so I've been really praying for wisdom for um, the leadership team and the ministers. Yeah. Let's just take a second now and just really pray for some of those things. Look, Lord, we pray for the work that Jules is involved in with the community uh, care hotline, the community fridge, CAP, and so many of these other initiatives to connect in our community, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you make this an, an initiative, not just for now, but uh, a spirit of generosity amongst us as people to reach out to the community in need. Amen. Amen. Yeah. 
and I will wait for the Lord and I will trust in Him alone and I For the everlasting love of the everlasting God, no, it will not shift or ever fade away. No, the everlasting love oh, of the Thank you so much, Luke. Before Steve comes to speak to us, we're going to spend some time praying together and also just going to bring our offerings before God. Thank you so much for those who give in such a variety of ways. And if you'd like to give through the gift app, then feel welcome to do that. Let's pray. I'm sure many of you have heard that beautiful song that's been circulating on social media this week that was written by Carrie Job and friends. And, <clears throat> and They've sung a beautiful song of blessing over our nation. And Jill referred to it in her Monday email. So if you haven't had a chance to hear it yet, then I would really recommend you go back to that email and check the link. And we're going to use that along with um, the verses that it comes from in number six in Deuteronomy 28 to lead us through our prayers this morning. So I'm going to speak that blessing over you. And then we're going to go into a time of worship. And kids, if you've managed to do your pictures and drawings about the people that you're wanting to see blessed, now is your time to use that to pray creatively for those that you care about. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Let's start off by praying for blessing upon our families, those with whom we live, our children, maybe our spiritual children, those for whom we care for <clears throat> and encourage and point towards Jesus. Father, we ask that you would pour your blessings out upon our families. Would they see you? Would they know you at this time? For those who don't yet know you, would you reveal yourself to them? We ask that they, they would see your favour. They would see your face smiling upon them. Thank you, Lord. We pray for our streets, Lord God. We thank you for the neighbours that you've placed us amongst. We pray your blessing upon our neighbours. We pray your blessing upon the streets that we walk. And we ask that you would reveal yourself to those around us. Would you give us opportunities to be answers to prayers? Would we be able to be those who carry your love into other people's lives? We pray for our town. We pray your blessing upon our shops, upon our businesses. We thank you for those businesses that have managed to stay um, open during this time and others that have found creative ways of reaching their customers. 
Would you bless them? Would you come and meet with them? Would you protect them as they seek to serve us? And for those businesses and shops that have closed, Father, we pray that you would meet with them, those people that run them. Would you give them creative ways when they're able to reopen? Father, we pray your blessing upon our key workers. We thank you for those working in the front line of the NHS, of our care homes and other places of care. Those that are in the strategic decision-making places, would you bless them with wisdom? And those that are researching and coming up with creative medicines, Father God, would you give them discernment and understanding? And we pray your blessing upon our government. Would you give them wisdom as they seek to serve us as a nation? Would they hear good advice and would they work out together what is the best way forward? Would your blessing be upon them? May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Father, we thank you. You didn't just create the world and leave us to it. That Jesus, you came and made yourself so very present. And Father, I just pray now that those of us who are hurting, that, that we would hear your quiet, small voice of your affirmation and your love. And we pray for those hurting, mourning, those who are hungry, those who are finding it difficult to make ends meet. We pray your blessing to be upon them. Would they know that there is an amazing God who is for them? We pray for those nations that have been hit with such severe droughts. Would you come, Lord God? Would you make a way where there seems to be no way? May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Jesus, your death ended the separation that started in Eden. Your resurrection brought about reconciliation, and we thank you so much that, Father God, we can come into your presence because of Jesus. And, Father, we pray at this time that there'll be many, many people who have their eyes opened to know that they can come into your presence. Father God, I pray that we would hear your voice clearly about where we can be those who can be the answers to the prayers of those around us. Would we know your peace deep within? And would we be carriers of your peace? Would you use us to be agents in this world who bring about your love, your mercy and your peace? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're now going to hear from Steve, so I'm just going to pray for him as he comes to speak with us now. Father God, we thank you for Steve. We thank you for the way you've been speaking to him. Father, we thank you for the leadership he brings to our church community here. We thank you so much for the giftings that you've placed within him. And Father, we pray that as he speaks to us now, Holy Spirit, would you reveal your heart to us? Would we hear your voice? Would you speak with us? Would you change us? Would you make us more like you? Father, would you inspire Steve's words as he comes now? Amen. Good morning. So the Israelites are camped in the wilderness near to Sinai, the mountain. And Moses gets a visit from his uh, father-in-law, Jethro. Jethro brings along his, Moses' wife and two sons. He's greeted uh, very, very warmly uh, with Middle Eastern hospitality. Moses sits down with Jethro and tells him all that God has been doing for the Israelites, how they have been brought out of slavery in Egypt, the hardships that they faced, and, uh, and how God has saved them. And Jethro is absolutely blown away. He, he's uh, not, not part of this faith community, but he recognises the power of God. He says, now I know that the Lord is greater than every other God. And he's, he's full of 
praise and rejoicing for all that God has done for Moses and his people. And they sit down and they have a meal. Uh, Aaron's there and all the elders of the community join in, in a celebration meal. The next day, well, the next day I'm going to, uh, I'm going to read about that from, from the passage. We're reading from Exodus chapter 19. I'd like to just correct myself. We're reading from Exodus chapter 18, verse 13, which picks up the story that I've begun. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people. And they stood around him from morning till evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, because the people come to me and seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me. And I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. Moses' father-in-law replied, what you're doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me and I'll give you some advice and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain and appoint them as officials. Over thousands, hundreds, fifties and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases, they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties and tens. They served as judges for the peoples at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simpler ones they decided themselves. Then Moses sent his father-in-law on his way and Jethro returned to his own country. I want to uh, just lift two things from this passage that I feel are important. They're not difficult things, and you don't have to dig too deep in the passage to find them. First, there's something about relief. Secondly, there's something about release. Relief and release. Relief for the leader and release for the community. I'm just going to spend just a few minutes um, unpacking those ideas. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot do this on your own. That's the advice of Jethro, father-in-law, come management consultant to, to Moses, his son-in-law. The work is too heavy. You cannot do this on your own. Very practical, very important for Moses at this point in his leadership career. There was something about that in the, in the, in the story that Liz told, wasn't there? You remember where um, Moses is, is holding up the staff and all the time the staff is high, the, the, the battle goes for Israel and when the, the, the staff comes down or his hands come down, the, the battle goes against Israel. There's an important lesson in there about um, where the battle lies. It's not with weaponry or, or skills, but um, from the Lord. Um, and so this was an important lesson. Um, but there's something else about that story where um, when Moses begins to flag, 
Um, a stone is brought, he sits upon it, and Aaron and her stand on either side of him and lift up his hands. Moses needs some help to fulfill the task that God has given him. And in a way, Jethro's um, advice here is extending that lesson a little bit further. The work is heavy. You need some help. I think there's something here about responsibility and how we carry it. We all have responsibility. And yet sometimes we can carry it in a way that wears us down. I, I, I learned a little bit about this um, not long ago. I was on a retreat. And uh, during the time um, I was there, um, God was speaking to me. And he was showing me or taking me to episodes in my life where he'd been working to, to shape me as, as a man, as a leader, as a, as a husband, as a son, as a, as a brother. And uh, it, was a, it was a deeply moving time as I thought back over and, and in, in a way relived some quite difficult bits of my life and saw God's hand, understood a little bit more of what God was doing to shape me as his son. And I, I sense God begin to ask me, do, do, you, do you see, Steve, that um, you can trust me? You can trust my work in your life? And I said, yes, I, I can see that. And then it seemed that God went further with me, probing a little deeper. And can you see that you can trust me with the work that I'm doing in the church, in the world, in my redemptive work? And I said, yeah, sure. And then it seemed that God said to me, um, Steve, I want you to remember who's ultimately responsible for my work. And that's me, that's God. And it was quite a, a moment where I, I was quite broken, actually, as I had to kind of face the fact that sometimes um, I carry the weight of responsibility for the things I'm involved with in a way that's not good for me uh, and not good for those who live with me and those I seek to serve. It was a moment in which God reminded me, who is God here? And, uh, and, and I, I began to learn from that moment to carry my responsibility more lightly. This is not to say that we don't have responsibilities. All of us do. Fa family responsibilities, um, perhaps you're um, uh, an employer in a small business. And at, at this time that we're living at the moment, perhaps the weight of that bears particularly heavily upon you. I'm not saying that we don't have responsibilities. But there seems to be an important lesson here in the text about uh, how we carry those responsibilities. The possibility that sometimes our sense of responsibility can be kind of overblown or overgrown um, beyond what it should be. And we need to remember who is God. Jesus made this invitation to his followers. Come to me and rest. Come to me, take my yoke upon you and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke it's not heavy, not too difficult to bear. Come learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. These are beautiful words and an amazing invitation that's been important in my spiritual journey and, and in the journey of many others, that we learn to bear responsibility lightly. And um, what, what this led to for me was the idea of being a joyful participant in God's redemptive purposes. Remembering who is God, remembering who carries the responsibility ultimately, and then joining in with him with a lighter load. So that's about release for leaders. The other side, or rather relief for leaders, the other uh, theme that I wanted to briefly uh, step into is release for the community. And you can probably see straight away that these two things relate to one another. When leaders learn to carry their responsibilities lightly and share their load with others, that leads to the release of the community. All the gifts of the community 
are released instead of being locked up. It's possible to lead in a way, whether we're talking about parenting or in business or in church, that, um, that kind of keeps the gifts of others locked up because we've taken too much onto ourselves. Uh, Pete Gregg says in his book on prayer, sometimes we need to come before our God and and give up our Messiah complex, give up our um, mission to to save the world, remembering that that's God's part and that we join with him in that. When we do that, we become enabling leaders and the gifts of others are unlocked. And so groups of a thousand, groups of a hundred, groups of fifty groups of 10 in the Israelite community, each given leadership um, to to help those different groups. That's a release of gifting that's good for the community, bringing relief to Moses and release to the community. Now, it's perhaps worth me just noting that uh, as we talk about those who lead a thousand or a hundred or 10, it's very easy for us to think of a pecking order there as if, there's something much more superior about the leader who speaks to the nation. And I want to kind of check that straight away because, of course, that wouldn't be uh, a very uh, uh, Christ-like way of thinking. In fact, Jesus spent quite a lot of his teaching ministry helping his disciples to understand that the greatest in the kingdom were those who came as servants. And so, um, if I put it this way, that uh, there are certain skills and gifts that are needed for someone to speak to a nation and to teach a nation. There are other gifts that are needed to be able to work well with a small group of people, a much more kind of intimate setting, a much deeper work, one might argue. And uh, it may have been that Moses would have made a terrible small group leader. Do you get what I'm saying? That actually it's not about a pecking order, it's about spheres of service. And it's all about service. And every gift is needed. That huge variety of gifts that um, are are there in the followers of Christ, in all people really, being released by enabling leadership. This comes really to a a kind of fulfilment on the day of Pentecost. And we're coming up to Pentecost. We'll be celebrating um, the gift of the spirit to the church in a few weeks time. Um, One of the standout characteristics of Pentecost is that when the Spirit of God came upon God's people, um, then all kinds of gifts were released for the building up of the body. And as the Spirit orchestrates this, those gifts work together to see God's redemptive purposes come. So enabling leadership is one of those gifts. We um, have a set of values as a church community, and one of them is enabling leadership. We want all our leaders to be bringing others on, um, identifying gifts, and getting those gifts active in the life of our community. That brings relief to the leader and release to the community of God's people. Well, I think that's as much as I I want to do with these themes, I really wanted to open the the two themes up, but then you can see that they're twin themes. I want to encourage you to bring your heart to God over this. You may be one of those who carries responsibility heavily, who sometimes forgets who's in charge. And maybe bring your heart to God in that and talk to God about how you carry responsibility and hear the invitation of Christ to rest, to take up that lighter yoke, to learn of Christ. And let God lead you into enabling leadership in family, in industry, in church, community, whatever sphere, to to enable others as God enables you. So the Lord bless you. And and may he do a great work in you in the days to come. My hope is built on nothing less Than Jesus' blood and righteousness 
I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Darkness seems to hide his face, yeah. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, yeah. My anchor holds within the veil, oh. Thank you for joining us uh, this morning, or whenever you're viewing. Um, just a reminder that all our services remain on our um, YouTube channel, so you can go and look at those at any time. I'm going to uh, bring a blessing in just a moment. And then after that, um, Luke Hamlin is um, going to be playing us out. We're going uh, to, uh, to a song that we've heard already this morning, but it's been put in a different setting. This is a, a video of Luke um, leading a song in the context of the city. Early in the morning, 
So there's, there's no one around. It was before lockdown, but you, you see an empty city. And uh, there's something about this, as I, as I viewed it earlier in the week, that just brought a prayerfulness to my soul for the city, um, which at this time is kind of waiting, waiting for what happens next. And it's a lovely song of blessing over the city. So see what, see what you make of that. I hope that you enjoy that and that it's part of your worship this morning. Let me bless you in the words of Paul. Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The Lord bless you. We will run and not get weary. We will walk and not be faint. We will ride on winds like eagles. We will never be the same. We will run and not get weary. We will walk and not be faint. We will.
shift or ever fade away No, it will not shift or